way. This morning I want to speak to you uh, from the book of 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and be looking in verses 13 through 18, and I'm going to be preaching a series of messages on the end times, and uh, well, we should call it biblical prophecy, is what I'll be speaking on today specifically, I'll be talking about the rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. But if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about it or not, but the Bible has a lot of unscientific things. Uh, uh, Things happen in the Bible that defy logic, that uh, uh, as far as... uh, a normal life is concerned, make no sense. Unexplainable, inexplicable things occur in the Bible. Let me give you some examples. For, for, uh, for years, people have doubted the creation, that God could actually speak creation into existence. By the word of his mouth, he could speak and creation would begin. That seems unscientific to the modern man, but yet uh, the problem is not that... Uh, Uh, God can't do it. The problem is modern man's idea of God is way too small. Uh, uh, The resurrection, uh, how how medically sound is the doctrine of the resurrection? Well, there's no no scientific way to prove or disprove uh, the resurrection. And it's the same with the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you say that one of these days the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come from heaven with a voice, with the shout of the archangel and a trumpet and the dead in Christ, why people look at you today and say, well, how likely is that to happen? It's never happened. We don't read about it in none of our history books, our science books, our anthropology books, uh, even in a lot of our theology books we don't read about it. But yet we believe every bit of that. I believe God created the world. I believe Jesus rose from the grave. And I believe Jesus is coming back. Hallelujah. Now, this this thing of this COVID-19 has brought uh, people back around to wanting to know about Bible prophecy. Uh, You just just, uh, do a little bit of search on on your Google engine, and you'll find out exactly what I mean. For example, I just typed it in, and, and, and lots of pages came up. One headline said, Donald Trump brings biblical prophecy alive in Jerusalem. And that was back when uh, they moved the embassy from uh, uh, back into Jerusalem. And then uh, a recent one said this, the coronavirus, this was two days ago, the coronavirus, comma, spreading biblical pestilence. And so even secular uh, writers uh, are, are looking at this and Uh, You know, they used to have this phrase they used for a while, and I hadn't heard it at all. They talked about biblical proportions. It came in biblical proportions. Somehow they're not using that to apply to this COVID-19. But with the rise of CV-19, people are once again interested in Bible prophecy. And so in the next few weeks, what I'm going to do is I'm going to present a series of messages on biblical prophecy. And I'm not trying to uh, present these to scare anybody. And uh, I'm not trying to use sensationalism to get people to make a decision. Uh, What I am trying to do is trying to remind people what the Scripture says and to get people ready and to encourage people to share Christ with those uh, who are unsaved while they have an opportunity to be saved. Now, 
when it comes to the subject of biblical prophecy, there are multitudes of opinions and beliefs, doctrines, and slivers of doctrines out there. And since biblical prophecy is, for some people, complicated, confusing, and, and, and downright frustrating and a little bit frightening, a lot of people would prefer to just ignore it. Just, uh, you know, uh, the old idea about um, that my theology is the pan theory. I believe it's all going to pan out in the end. Uh, that's the way some people do. I, I had one person tell me, uh, well, it's all going to turn out like the Lord wants it to, so why should I concern myself with it? Well, I understand that, but, but here's the thing. We've got to know what the Bible teaches about Bible prophecy so that we can counteract the deception that's out there. There is so much false information about uh, the Bible prophecy, end times, major events, and uh, we need to know that so that we'll know when we're hearing lies about Bible prophecy. Uh, also, biblical prophecy is a major biblical doctrine. It is a major theme in both Old Testament and the New Testament. And therefore, because it's in the Bible, we ought to study it. And then also, Jesus repeatedly told us to be ready, to be on the alert, to stay on the alert. Uh, and, and, and the Apostle Paul and Peter also reminded us to be ready because we know not what the hour. It'll come like a thief in the night. We're told this repeatedly in the Scripture. So in order to stay ready, we need to know what the Scripture says so that we'll be ready. And so... Uh, the central truth of this message is simply that. We should all be ready when Jesus comes. We should all be ready when Jesus comes. Now, what I want to do in this message is I want to give you a wide overview of some things that are going to happen uh, related to biblical prophecy. Uh, I'm going to give you about five things, and we're not going to get real deep into each one of them, but in the next few messages, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each one of these subjects and break it down a little better. So today's just going to be kind of like a, an introduction, if you will. And so the first thing I want to say is, the, and, and this is the next event in, in biblical prophecy, is called the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church. Now, today, uh, you and I, we live in this time period uh, theologians and Bible students call the church age. It's a, it's a distinct age of time. Historically, God has always dealt with people in different ages in different ways. For example, you could say from Adam until they were expelled from the Garden of Eden, God dealt with them on a personal basis. He walked with them in the garden. God doesn't deal with people that way anymore. Uh, then uh, you could say from the expulsion until Noah's Ark. God dealt with people, uh, and then he brought about the great flood. Then after the flood, uh, you read how God chose Abraham and began to reveal himself through Abraham and through the sons of, uh, of, of Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob and Israel. And then they went down to, uh, to Egypt, and uh, after that, Moses came along, and God sent the law. And so he had this whole time span where all of Israel lived under the law, and that included the kings and the Old Testament prophets and all that. And during those times, uh, broadly speaking, God primarily worked through the nation of Israel. God made an everlasting covenant with Abraham uh, and Abraham's offspring. And there are still aspects of the Abrahamic covenant that God will fulfill during the Great Tribulation. We'll talk about that in the next message. But after the Lord Jesus died on the cross, and then he rose from the grave, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came uh, and ushered in what we now call the church age. Um, the church age is also called in the scripture the times of the Gentiles. Uh, there's a couple of verses you may want to write them down, go back and look at them later. Uh, Luke 21, 24 and Romans 11, 25 both make reference to this age called the times of the Gentiles. And we live in this church age and the, the church is the body and the bride of Christ. 
And so in this current time frame in which we live in, God is primarily working through his people, the bride of Christ, the church. The Holy Spirit resides within the hearts of the individual Christian and the church collectively. But uh, one of these days, one of these days, and we have no idea when, and here's the thing about the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church is going to happen immediately without warning. There's no sign that has to be fulfilled. There's, no, uh, there's, there's nothing needs to happen for the church to be raptured. What does that word rapture mean? Uh, in the text in verse 17, it says, And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. That word caught up is harpazo in the Greek language. And it's only used three times in the scripture. And each time it means catching away or snatching away. It's like my daddy used to say to me when I was misbehaving. He'd say, boy, you want me to come in there and snatch you up? Well, I knew what snatching up meant. It meant I was, my feet was going to leave the ground. And uh, uh, the rapture is when Jesus comes to catch his bride up to meet him, the Bible says, in the air. And so at any moment, without any warning, Every spirit-born person on planet Earth could be snatched away suddenly. Now, can you imagine what that's going to be like? One of these days, we don't know when. It could be before I get done preaching. It could be 100 years from now. I don't think it will be, but it might be. I don't know. One of these days, all the Christians on planet Earth will suddenly just disappear. Just suddenly the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Faster you can blink an eye, pews will be empty, churches will be gone, preachers will be gone. Now, the ones that will be left, I feel sorry for them. But uh, uh, at any moment, uh, we could be out of here. And so uh, the thing is, if you're not saved, you're going to stay. Only the church is going to leave at the rapture. The rapture is a secret thing. It's a, it's a sudden, swift departure without warning and without sign. And so uh, the rapture of the church could happen at any moment. Then what's going to follow the rapture of the church? Will there be people still on planet Earth? Well, what's going to follow then is a time period known as the Great Tribulation Period. Currently, we're in the church age. But when the church leaves, we are going to enter into what is called the Great Tribulation. Now, uh, the Great Tribulation, during that time, the world, the entire planet, is going to be hurled into an unprecedented time of wrath and judgment and confusion. The Great Tribulation is when God begins to pour out His wrath upon planet Earth. In, in a fashion that's never been seen before. And you can just imagine what the World Health Organization may do when suddenly, without warning, hundreds of Christians vanish worldwide uh, in the thin air. They'll come up with some way of explaining it, and uh, 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 they'll, they'll try, to, they'll try to, uh, to, to coalesce around some, some theme and and uh, there are multiple prophecies in the Bible about the Great Tribulation period. The prophet Jeremiah called the Great Tribulation period a time called Jacob's Trouble. Uh, there's an expression used quite often in the Bible. Not every time does it refer to the Great Tribulation, but many times it does. And especially in the New Testament, it's called the Day of the Lord. The Day of the Lord. And... Um, uh, Jesus talked about this time of tribulation. In Matthew 24, verse 21, Jesus said, For then there will be a great tribulation, such as not has occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So Jesus talked about this time of tribulation. He said it'll be unprecedented. No time's ever been like it. Now, during the Great Tribulation, there will be the rise of a, of a world leader. Many times we refer to him as the Antichrist. And the Antichrist will, at the uh, very beginning of the tribulation period, one of the things he'll do, according to Daniel 9, 24 through 27, the Antichrist is going to make an agreement or a covenant with the nation of Israel. And uh, at first, 
uh, he's going to seem to be friendly to the Jewish state. Uh, but in the Bible, he is called the beast or the man of sin, the son of perdition. And he will make this covenant with Israel uh, after the rapture of the church. And then three and a half years into that agreement, the Antichrist will break that covenant. And uh, his, his wrath will be poured out on the Jewish people. And the Antichrist's goal at three and a half years into the tribulation will be to eradicate every Jew from planet Earth. That's going to be his goal. Uh, the scripture is very explicit about that. Uh, you can read Zechariah 12 and 14. And the only way that the nation of Israel survives, anybody of the Jewish race makes it through, is when the Lord Jesus himself returns. Not in the rapture, but when he comes in glory, which will be at the end of the tribulation. And the Bible says that he will land on the Mount of Olives and he will save the sons of Israel. And uh, you may remember that I said that uh, we're living in the church age, but God still has some promises that he's going to fulfill to Abraham and the Jewish people. And one of the main reasons, uh, one of the main things God accomplishes in the great tribulation is he brings a remnant of Jews to faith in Christ. And they turn to their Messiah and they inherit the land of Israel and they reign with Christ for a thousand years. And also during the Great Tribulation, the Antichrist will cause people to take what is called the mark of the beast. Now, after the rapture, now, uh, we're getting ready for this right now. We're, we're just getting primed and ready. The whole nation right now is set up for anybody who's scared to death to take a mark. They'll take a tattoo. They'll take a, they'll take a microchip. People will do anything right now just to get diapers. I mean, just to get toilet paper. I mean, you know, we've, we've seen how people are. And, and so after the rapture, the church is gone, and the world will see the rise of a leader, one like never such has been in history. He'll be uh, uh, Napoleon and Hitler and, and every mad megalomaniac roll into one. He will rule and dominate the entire world. And one thing the Antichrist will do is he'll require every person on planet Earth to take some kind of a mark. We don't know what this mark is, but the Bible says that you have to take the mark on your wrist or on your forehead. And without such a mark, you'll not be able to purchase, do business, buy or sell. And the Antichrist will have total control over the economy and he'll be able to track the movement of every person on the planet. Now, uh, just, just when I started in the ministry about 40 years ago, uh, people used to almost scoff at these kinds of things. They used to mock at it. Theologians used to say, that's never going to happen. There's no such way anything like that could ever even take place. But just in a mere 40 years, we see how it'd be totally possible today. And there's, I believe we're getting ready for it to, to happen. Also, during the Great Tribulation period, uh, there will be violence, plagues, famines, earthquakes on a massive scale, on a massive scale. Like I said, the Great Tribulation is also called the Day of the Lord. And uh, it, it, it mean, the Day of the Lord means it's a time of God's judgment. And during the final seven-year period, the Great Tribulation will last seven years. God will hurl massive plagues onto planet Earth. And some of these plagues that are described in the book of Revelations literally wipe out a third of the population of earth at one time. Uh, I mean, th this, is, this is crazy. And the Bible says there'll be famines. Uh, today's pandemics, the one we're enduring right now, as bad as it is, as much as I hate it, it's minuscule compared to what is coming. During the Great Tribulation period, to not take the mark of the beast will be considered an act of treason. And those who refuse will be killed unless they can escape. In this current pandemics that we uh, uh, are undergoing, matter of fact, I was reading while we're going through this pandemic here in the United States, do you realize that Northern Africa is being eaten alive by locusts, one of the worst locust plagues 
in history has hit northern Africa. They say there's going to be famines of un, 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 uh, untold proportions uh, in Africa due to the fact that the locusts have eaten everything. And so while we're dealing with COVID-19 in another part of the world, there's a, there's a massive locust plague going on. And uh, what, what is this? People say, is this a sign that we're coming to the end? Well, here's what I believe it is. These current pandemics, earthquakes, the, the attempt at globalism that we see, uh, all, the, all the nations of the world wanting to get together, and, and, and what they are is they foreshadow the tribulation. They're just getting ready, getting things in place so that the great tribulation can just happen. Uh, for example, you, you may remember prior to Jesus coming, he sent forth John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the last Old Testament prophet, but his ministry bled over into the New Testament. That's because the things in the Old Testament foreshadowed the things in the New Testament. Well, I believe that, that there are things happening now at the end of the church age that are foreshadowing the great tribulation period, which is next. And I believe that as, as the closer we get to the great tribulation, the more of these things we're going to see until finally the church is raptured and the tribulation begins. And I think we're very near that time. Uh, and so I believe that the world is ready. I believe now we have a global tracking system. Uh, we see the acceptability of our citizens uh, readily give up all their rights. Uh, people today are just ready to, to turn their rights over to the government and uh, just whatever, just, just keep us safe. The world is ready to follow the Antichrist because of the, uh, the, 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 the weakness of the pulpits and the churches in America today. Often people ask me, Pastor Steve, do you think the Antichrist is alive and on planet Earth today? Well, I want you to consider that the Antichrist is a man. He's not Jesus. He's not divine. He's not a God-man. He is a man who is the tool of Satan. He is a person who is totally consumed and uh, 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 obsessed with doing the will of Satan. And here's what the Antichrist is. The Antichrist, it, unlike Jesus who was born uh, divine, the Antichrist is a man who becomes the Antichrist. Now, now that doesn't mean he was born the Antichrist. It, it may mean that, that, that God knew he would become the Antichrist, but he is a man who Satan enters into and takes over so that the, the person who will become the Antichrist could be alive in any generation as long as everything gets lined up and then Satan will enter into that person and he will do what the Antichrist does now I'm not looking for the Antichrist I'll be honest with you I don't want to see him don't want to know him don't care who he is I'm not looking for any signs for him no marks from him I don't care what he's got to say what he thinks or 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 anything about him because I'm looking for the Lord Jesus Christ to come in the clouds to take me out of here hallelujah and I'm listening I'm listening for the trumpet I'm looking for gravity to leave the ground and I'm going to head out of here and uh Listen, uh, there's a lot of people who believe the church is going to go through the tribulation. I don't believe that, and here's why. Uh, well, I'll, I'll explain a lot of reasons why, but one of the reasons I don't believe the church is going through the tribulation is because the church is the bride of Christ. And the tribulation period is the time when God the Father pours His wrath out on planet Earth. And for the church to be here, it would be God pouring out His wrath on the bride of Christ. And we've been spared from the wrath to come. And so I'm looking for the trumpet sound. I'm not looking for the Antichrist. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 1.10 that Jesus rescues the church from the wrath to come. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 and 10, For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. And so, uh, it's very important to make certain that you are saved. That's why it's so important. Now, there's a lot of reasons you need to make sure you're saved. But one of the main reasons is the rapture could happen at any moment. 
at any moment without any warning. The rapture, if it occurs, and you're not a Christian, you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You, you're thinking, well, one of these days I might. One of these days I'm, I'm going to when I get through sowing my wild oats or when I get through with this part of my life or I graduate or whatever. I, I'm going to get, get serious about God one of these days. I, I mean to. I, I plan on it. And you're going to do that. But not yet. You're putting it off. You're waiting. Well, what if the rapture happens? What if all of a sudden the trumpet blows and the church is ushered out of here and caught up together to meet the Lord in the air and you're left? You're left without Christ. You're left to go through this awful time and be forced to either take a mark and join up with the son of Satan or die and, and, and refuse to take the mark of the beast. That'll be your two choices. If the rapture occurs and you're not a believer, you'll be left behind to face the awful time called the great tribulation. And so I want to urge you and plead with you this morning, if you're not saved, to be saved. Be saved today. Matter of fact, stop what you're doing right now. Bow your heads and receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Then at the end of the great tribulation, the third thing that's coming up in biblical prophecy is a time that we call the glorious return of Christ to the earth. And he's coming to establish his millennial kingdom. Millennial means 1,000. It'll be a thousand year kingdom. Now, people always say, how will the tribulation end? Well, the scripture is extremely plain, and it's not hard to figure out, that um, the power-mad Antichrist will start a campaign, like I said, to exterminate every Jew living on the planet. And uh, he will somehow or another convince all the world armies to surround the, the, the country of, of Israel, especially the city of Jerusalem, with the intentions of wiping it out. And here's what the Bible says in Zechariah 12, 3. It will come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will be severely injured. And all the, listen, all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. And so what he means there is the prophet says the nations will see uh, Jerusalem and the Jewish state as a heavy stone. Anybody that tries to lift it, it, it hurts their back. Anybody messes with Jerusalem and, and the Jews, even today, nobody dares mess with them because, they, but, but they all see them as a problem. Every, uh, all the countries in, in the Middle East see uh, Jerusalem and, 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 and Israel as the problem. It's a heavy stone. And so the Antichrist will uh, lead all the armies of the world to surround the nation of Israel during the tribulation. And they'll attack Israel and invade the city of Jerusalem, but they're not expecting this. Here's what happens in Zechariah 14, verse 2. Listen to this. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured, the houses plundered, the women ravished, and half the city exiled, but the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. So it looks like the Antichrist is going to win. He's got Jerusalem completely surrounded. They're cut off, no place left to go until verse 3. Listen to what it says, Zechariah 14, verse 3. Then the Lord, now this is the Lord coming in his glory. This is not the rapture. This is at the end of the tribulation. And he says, then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. So Jesus is going to come in glory. He's going to land on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in the middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. Wow, that's going to be some rocking and rolling when the earth starts shaking and Jesus lands on the Mount of Olives. The Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, will come and then all the Jews who are alive will look on him who they've pierced and they will turn to their Messiah. And listen to what Jesus does when he, when he finally gets, gets situated on the Mount of Olives. In verse 12 of Zechariah 14. 
Now this will be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the peoples who have gone to war against Jerusalem. In other words, the Antichrist has got all these armies surrounding Jerusalem. They're going to wipe out the Jews. They've attacked Jerusalem. And the only rescue they have is the glorious return of their Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He lands on the Mount of Olives. And now he's ready to take care of business. And here's what happens to all those armies. Their flesh will rot while they stand on their feet. And their eyes will rot in their sockets. And their tongue will rot in their mouth. And it will come about in that day that a great panic from the Lord will fall on them. And they will seize one another's hand. And the hand of one will be lifted against the hand of the other. They're just going to go berserk because of the terror of the returning Lord Jesus Christ. And so at the end of the tribulation... That is when the Lord comes in the clouds in great glory. And that's what Matthew said in Matthew 24. Matthew 24, at the end of the tribulation, listen to what Jesus said, uh, Matthew said, uh, or quotes Jesus. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. That's exactly what Zechariah said would happen at the end of the tribulation. And what Jesus does when he comes at the end of that tribulation period is he sets up what we call the millennial kingdom, a thousand-year reign of Christ. Revelation 20 predicts a thousand years of peace on the earth. It's also predicted in many prophecies. The prophecy that I read this morning where they'll beat their swords into plowshares and uh, their, their spears into pruning hooks. That'll happen during the thousand year reign of Christ. Uh, Isaiah 11 verse 9 says, They'll not hurt or destroy on my holy mountain. The earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. Then, in that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal for the people, and his resting place will be glorious. And that day is coming, beloved. That day is coming when the Lord Jesus Christ returns in glory and reigns from his throne, and the church will come with him. Uh, the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians that he'll come with, 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 with his saints in flaming fire, dealing out vengeance on them that know not God. And so the church will come and they will reign with Jesus on planet earth for a thousand years. What a day that'll be. And then another event, the final one I want to speak about this morning that is coming. And that is called the great white throne judgment of the unsaved. Now, during the millennial kingdom, that thousand-year time period, Satan, the Bible says in Revelation 20, is bound with a chain. And he's put into a prison, and uh, he's held there for a thousand years. Can you imagine living on planet Earth with no devil? I mean, for a thousand years, Jesus rules. Jesus is the law. Jesus, and we got perfect peace. There's not a war. There's no pandemics. There's no earthquakes and nothing. Jesus is reigning for a thousand years. And people are having children and, and life is going on on planet earth. And Satan is bound in a prison for the whole time. And during that time, the earth will be repopulated with people. And those born during the millennium, you know, suppose you're born 400 years into the millennium. You've got no memory of the great tribulation. That'll just be ancient history. And, uh, uh, People will become accustomed to the blessings they enjoy. And at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ, the millennial kingdom, this is what the Bible says will happen. Revelation 20, verse 7 and 8. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. At the end of the millennium, thousand-year period, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for war, and the number of them is like the sand of the sea. And you can read that whole episode there because Satan deceives people again at the end of the millennium, and he has one more rebellion in him, and, uh, but this is 
is put down by the Lord Jesus Christ uh, very quickly. And then at the end of that rebellion, we have described the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment. And uh, it's found in Revelation 15, uh, 20, verses 11 through 15. Uh, but uh, the great white throne judgment is the final judgment of God upon lost people. Now, if you read that passage of Scripture, as a matter of fact, let me just turn over there and, and, and just read it. Uh, here's what it says, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat upon it, and whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. The books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. The sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead were in them. They were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The great white throne judgment is not a place to determine whether a person is saved or lost. It is a place where God, the Almighty, issues his holy, final sentence on all the unsaved for all of eternity. Did you notice as I read there, they are not judged according to grace. They are not judged according to mercy. They are not judged according to the compassion of Christ. What are they judged based on? They are judged two times in that passage according to their deeds. That's why they're judged. And they get exactly what they deserve. And the dead and the small stand before God. And uh, there is no escape. They're judged, every one of them. And it says in Revelation 20, verse 15, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And so uh, for all this time, all these people have been, been uh, 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 dead uh, without Christ. They've been in a place called torment. And then at the great white throne judgment at the end of the millennial reign, Christ is going to haul all of them up before him at the great white throne and pronounce sentence on them for all of eternity and they'll be cast into the lake of fire. That's what the Bible teaches. And then finally, after the millennium, after the great white throne judgment, Revelation 21 and 22 describes what we call the eternal state. And that is the time that follows the millennial kingdom. And it just says this, Revelation 21, verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And they will no longer be any death. There will be no longer any death. There will, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And so uh, that's just a broad, broad uh, overview of some major mountaintops of Bible prophecy. Uh, the next event that we can expect to happen is the rapture of the church. And uh, I, I believe, somebody says, do you think we're very close? Well, let me put it to you this way. We're closer today than we were yesterday. And every day that goes by, we get closer and closer and closer. And the Bible says it's going to happen. And we've seen the reemergence of the modern state of Israel, which uh, is, is basically a phenomenon for many centuries. Uh, the, the biblical theologians couldn't figure these scriptures out because there was no nation of Israel. Now there is. Uh, we see technology is now available for the mark of the beast and the actions predicted by the Antichrist during the tribulation period. We see the escalation of wars and famines and plagues and anti-God and anti-Christian bigotry is beginning to, to, to rise up everywhere you look. People are against the church and against the... And then also what we're seeing in a large segment of the church today is what's called the apostasy or the great falling away. Paul says in Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, 1, the Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times, some will fall away, that is, apostatize from the faith. 
paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. They're falling for doctrines taught by demon-possessed people. The church today has accepted, now I want you to understand something, we are in the midst of this great apostasy in America, in the church. The, 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 the modern church has accepted immorality without question. Mainline denominations now are not just accepting, they are full-throated endorsing immorality. Uh, many churches today are saturated with false teachings of the prosperity gospel. There's a growing trend today, even in conservative evangelical church, churches, towards a leftist Marxist agenda that they're calling social justice. And, 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 and there's many, many more churches that are just plain dead. I mean, I talked to one person when I lived over on the Eastern Shore, and they told me they went to a church that uh, uh, the baptistry, they went and looked in the baptistry, and they had piled lumber in the baptistry. Lumber in the baptistry. And this, this, this poor soul said, I've been going to this church all my life. We've not baptized anybody in 24 years. They all locked the door and go join a real church. Hallelujah. Uh, just a lot of churches are dead. Let me just end with this. The winter of 1991 issue of a magazine called University of Pacific Review gives a chilling description of the 1986 Chernobyl nuclear disaster. There, there were two electricians or two electrical engineers in control room that night and the best thing they could, that could be said for them was that they were, uh, they were playing around with the machine. And they were performing what the Soviets later described as an unauthorized experiment. They were trying to see how long a turbine would freewheel when they took the power off of it. I don't know anything about nuclear turbines, but this makes sense to me. Uh, now, now, taking the power off of that kind of a nuclear reactor is difficult. It's a dangerous thing to do because these reactors are very unstable uh, in their lower ranges. In order to get the reactor down to the kind of power where they perform the test they were interested in performing, they had to override manually six separate computer-driven alarm systems. So in other words, they're monkeying around. They want to see how slow this thing can go. And there are six alarms going off, telling them to stop, stop, stop. One by one, computers came up saying, stop, dangerous, go no farther. And one by one, rather than shutting off the experiment, they shut off the alarms instead. And we all know the results. Nuclear fallout that was recorded all around the world from the largest industrial accident ever occurred in the world. And the instructions and the warnings in the scripture are just as clear. The scripture is our warning bell and they are going off. Ding, 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 ding. As we get nearer and nearer the time of the rapture of the church. And we can just ignore them and wait and see what happens. But if we do, it'll be to our own peril. I know that you know, and we all know, and we all sense that God is doing something unusual in our day. And one thing that we all know is that God wants every man, woman, boy, and girl to come to Christ and if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you're ready to meet the Lord in the air. And you'll be spared from the wrath to come. But maybe you know somebody who's not ready. Maybe you know somebody who, if Jesus came today, they'd be left behind and go through the great tribulation and possibly go to eternal damnation. And you see... They may not read the Bible, but if you're their friend, they'll listen to you. And so maybe, maybe, maybe you need to talk to them. And, 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 you know, most people are saved based on the testimony of a friend. And I just want to urge you to, to witness and share your faith with those who are not saved. 
And during this time of, of pandemic, when we're all trying to figure out this new normal, what we do need to do is be the obvious bride of Christ because people are looking for answers. And your testimony may be the very thing that God uses to bring them to Christ. You say, well, preacher, when is the rapture going to happen? I have no idea. It could be 100 years. I can't say. But I can't say it won't be today either. If I live to be six years older than I am today, I will have outlived my father. Now, I, I, he died at a very young age. <laughs> Getting younger every time I, I get closer to it. But nonetheless... Uh, if I live another six years, I'll outlive my dad. If I live another 20 years, I will live as old as just about everybody in my family, 80, 85 years old, about lifespan for our family. Now, my wife's family, they live like Methuselah, but uh, that's why I keep telling her she, she better start saving some money because when I'm gone. Uh, but uh, what I'm trying to say is in the next 20 years or less, I'll be with Jesus. I've been the pastor of this church for almost 14 years. In the next 20 years, I'll be with Jesus. More than likely. So if the rapture happens before then, I certainly want as many people to go as I can get to go. But even if not, my time is short. Our time is short. The Bible says life is but a vapor. And we don't need to waste it. We need to invest it for eternity. And so today, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I want you to just bow your head and close your eyes. And I just want to lead you in a simple prayer that goes like this. Now, if you're listening on a phone or by computer or on television, if you've never prayed and received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then I want you to just pray right now and say, Dear Lord Jesus, I am sorry for my sins. I believe you died on the cross for me. And I believe you're coming again. I believe you rose from the dead and you're coming again. Today I, I repent of my sin. Today I give my life to you. And I ask you to please come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins and be my Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And then today, if you're watching and you are a Christian and you're ready to go, and if the Lord was to call today, if the trumpet sound, you'd be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. But let me ask you something. Is there somebody that you know that you'd like to see go with you? But they're not ready. They're not ready. Then pray about and ask God to give you a way to share your faith with them. Dear Lord Jesus, give me a way. Let me witness you put the name in there. Let me share with them the love of Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.